to professions. All right. Well, hello, Gracie. Hey, Asher. Uh, let's let's start off like I really don't know where to start because you've got like a really <laughs> impressive, really huge resume. But the reason I learned about you is because you spent a couple of years at McMurdo Station, in Antarctica. So can you tell me a little more about how that happened and what that was like? Yeah. Um... I guess the Antarctica was in my sights for about 12 years before I actually got there. Um, it actually started in like the first day of ninth grade in our geography. I'm like geology, geography. Clearly I don't remember the content very well. I think it's geography. <laughs> she was um, giving us kind of a slideshow to give us context for what we we're going to learn that semester. And um, yeah, I don't know. She, she showed a picture of penguins in Antarctica and that's just my mind because <laughs> I'm like, you know, you grow up, you know, it's the seventh continent, but there's no anthropo like anthropological history to really learn about. And so at least that we know of right now. Um, <laughs> well, so, now there is because people have lived there for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Those Antarctic explorers. Um, so I guess it just didn't dawn on me that that's somewhere people go. And uh, when she showed that picture, it just kind of, planted a really important seed because I had this realization of like well if there's a picture of it that means someone went there oh my god there. I didn't even think of it that way I know I I was like so basic I was like I don't know 14 years old and and I was like if someone went there then maybe I could go there I don't know like it was this very sequential train of thoughts that probably happened in 30 seconds and um and it was like I said it was a seed and so over the course of the next 12 years, a bunch of random stuff out of my control happened that was super fortuitous, but also got me um, to the point where I knew I needed to make it my number one priority to try to get down there. So even though I had a master's degree, I was like, I'll wash dishes. I'll do anything. Did you so wash I dishes? Did, and I washed dishes. <laughs> and, it, you know, washing dishes on the coolest place on earth is pretty neat. So um from there, uh, a lot of people use that job as a stepping stone, and, and I certainly did. So I was able to get um, actually quite a variety of experiences in different departments and in different roles um, supporting science down there. Um, one highlight, and I would consider my main job down there, was as a fuels operator. And um, and so I would fuel aircraft and generators and you know heat oh. buildings and kind of move fuel from the different tanks and offload the fuel tanker and drive the fuel truck, you name it, everything fuel. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so everything it's kind of grunt fuel. work, but it was kind of an yeah. opportunity to work like on the actual operations. Totally, totally. So I think it, it kind of bridged that and also like very directly helped the scientific field camps that were set up to do research. So I thought that was neat to be in a position where I directly affected the work that goes on down there. Um, so I did that for eight seasons, including Ooh. three Antarctic winters. So during the summer in the US. Yeah, and I actually met my husband down there. So very cool. There he is. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering about that shoulder. Uh, yeah, it's a uh, not so mysterious shoulder now. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk a little more about like Antarctic culture? Yeah, gosh, I, I sit here wondering maybe what you've heard from James and he's- Oh, definitely... I, I mean, I know everything about this, but I want to hear yeah. it for the show. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I heard there's someone I know from Antarctica who I think uh, explained it really well that all these random outliers and unattached people in the world just kind of fall to the bottom of the earth. And <laughs> I- you know, I went down there unattached uh, relationally, but also looking forward to a community I read about. I had like done, I, I was just a sponge. Anything I would like follow all the Facebook links to the albums, to all the pictures. I'm like, I want to be at that party. I want to do that job. I want to look that cold. I want to feel that cold. I want <laughs> every bit of the experience. But that's the kind of people you often get down there. But you also, you know, there's a spectrum. So you get people who, you know, that was just the trades job they could find. Wow. And so you do get people who are there to do a job and, and they don't, um, and they may enjoy the community. They may find it, they like it even better than they thought, but some people are like, can't wait to get off this rock. <laughs> and, you know, you kind of get it. It's an extreme. It's a living. 
Yeah, it's an extreme place and it draws extreme people. And so um, in the same way that the community can mesh and uh, bond in ways that you don't see in a lot of places on earth, you also get people who, you know, pretty quickly, if they are not a good fit, it becomes pretty quickly apparent. And, um, oh, and they're stuck there until the plane goes out. Yeah, yeah. So I actually like the first day, speaking of stuck planes, um, I like the very first day. So, you know, my journey was like 12 years to get there. And my first day of work as a dining attendant, um, AKA dishwasher, um, <laughs> I checked my email at lunch and and my dad had gone into a coma and he actually died like two weeks, no, a week later. Oh gosh. But, yeah. So that's the kind of stuff like people go through a lot. Like there's all this life doesn't stop everywhere else. It keeps going. And so people down there also have another reason to bond together. It's like, you're all missing out on different things. There's different things happening in people's lives. I've been down there for a winter when a good friend's mom died. And, and then you really are stuck. I was lucky I could get out but it after six delays of the flight because of weather, right? Oh, like, no. just stuck. yeah, I mean, it's not. So, um, you know, the sacrifice is chosen. It, no one's making you do it, but it's it, not it, it like can... the last year, for instance. Right, right. And so, you know, you end up missing out on a lot of things, but that's just part of it. And so, you know, that the people who are dedicated to um, back to back seasons there are. You know, it, it's a really good fit for them because people do back to back, like they say, summer and winter. Yeah. So, oh um, I think the most they let you stay down there is like fourteen months at a time, and that's like if they're really pushing it. Um, as I said, like because it's a, an extreme place, it it doesn't provide opportunity for a sustainable balance that I would feel most humans need. Um, and so after a certain number of months, they, they're like, come on, kick you off. You get your 60 <laughs> days of sanity and green grass and tank tops, and, and then you can come back. But, you know, most people take a season off and um, yeah. So they do it kind of institutionalizes a little balance, but it's really just going from one extreme to another extreme. So we can So I have other extremes <laughs> to ask you about because like your resume is full of Okay, them. yeah. Like the most obviously <laughs> that, amazing well, the most obviously amazing thing you've done is unicycling across the U.S. Like, can yeah. you tell me, I guess from the start, how do you get interested in that? Yeah, you know, I think I was like 12 years old. And I don't know if your household growing up got these magazines where, where I was like more of a catalog. And it was all like full of useless things. But like, kind of like the Sky Mall before there was Sky Mall. We got the Oriental Trading Company catalogs. I don't okay. even know if they use that name anymore, but like they okay. sold a whole bunch of tchotchkes and trinkets. That was our, our magazine. That sounds like right up the same alley. So uh, there was like this full page picture of a kid on a unicycle. And it was this other moment of like, well, he's doing that. I could do that. <laughs> I want to try that. And so I very, like in my life, I just very quickly connect dots to like, I'm going to do it. That's such a powerful <laughs> so, drive. I love it. Ooh, but it can get you in some weird situations. So here we are. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I, it just drew me. It, it connected with whatever was going on in my head. So I was begged for it for Christmas. And um, my, my parents, I was just like elated when they got it for me because I just didn't expect it. It seemed like a big gift and we didn't grow up all that well off. And um, Did you know how to ride a bicycle at the time? Yeah, yeah. So I grew up in like the number one bike town in the US, Davis, California. And that's like where the US Bike Hall of Fame is. That's um, where the National Bike Museum is. And actually my unicycles are now in the National Bike Museum, which is cool. Uh, <laughs> partly because I was tired of like lugging them around places as a like free storage, <laughs> but I'll take it. You know what I mean? Can you take I'll it take out it. if you want to just do a spin? I've wondered that. I think I, I think I can because <laughs> I think the placard says on loan from, mm. I don't know. The tires are flat now, so I don't know. It still has like dirt all over it from my rides and I don't know, kind of gross. Um, but yeah, I grew up in a town where like, I don't even remember their, Oh, um, um, I don't even remember there being a school bus 
because everyone biked to school. So biking was like very much just a native language, I guess. I don't really know how else to describe it. But because of that, I ended up being a kid where it wasn't like a far-fetched idea. Um, the concept of biking across the country, like we were, we grew up in a culture of extreme bicyclists. So it was just like but, how you thought you would get across the country in the first place. Well, in a way, I mean, it was still like, a, felt like a little bit of a radical adventure. But I, after college, I really needed something kind of extreme just to like get mm. academics out of my system. And, and because of how I grew up, that was a natural choice. Um, and at the time I was like sometimes unicycling to class at college and, um, and you know, there's always like that kid on campus. And, oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah, me. But also I was like very pragmatic, pragmatic about it. I was like, look, I can just hop off real quick, go up the stairs, hop back on. I can take it to the classroom. Don't need to lock it up. No one's going to ride away on it. Like <laughs> it was very practical and I hate walking because it takes so long and that's hey, just man. how I am. And so it, to me, it made a lot of sense, but, um, and so when it came time to graduate, I was actually unicycling to class one day when, um, I, I think it just dawned on me. I had like been wanting to bike across the country. And then I started wondering, uh, if anyone had ever unicycled across country. And as we've <laughs> talked about those dots connect real quickly. So suddenly I'm unicycling across the country, but I did in my research of finding out whether anyone had done that. I found at the time, I think about. 10 men or like 10 or so men at the time. I know there's more now, but um, there, there hadn't been any record of a woman unicycling across the country. So I think to this day, at least to all the research I've done, I'm the only woman to have unicycled across the US. Heck so yeah. that's kind of a, I don't know. I mean, here's the thing. I think if you just pick something weird enough, you can be, have a world record too. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's a little <laughs> bit of it. I'm not going to lie. This is a little bit of the thesis of my show. Okay, cool. <laughs> awesome. Like I'm talking in the coming weeks to the Pokemon trading card game world champion. Oh man. And a person who's won a Pogo championship. And that's amazing. That's like just really niche fields that yeah. there's got to be a winner because they have tournaments. Yeah. There's got to be winners of things. There's got to be firsts of things. And, you know. So what's it like to ride coast to coast? Yeah, gosh, that was like the first big adventure like that, that I had undertaken. And um, I think that's probably why it ended up being the toughest for me. I think there's some mentalities and um, some abilities to overcome and adapt to challenges that you only learn through going through it. And so even though theoretically the Great Divide mountain bike route, which is what I did in 2009 on an off-road unicycle, um, theoretically that should have been harder, right? Like not even a man had done that. I was the first person to do that. Oh, wow. And, yeah. And so I just feel like, okay, theoretically that should have been way harder, but a lot of it I had already figured out. Uh, well, I used the first trip, the cross country trip, to figure out what kind of seat worked well for me. Cause let's be mm. honest, there's a really good reason that more people aren't unicycle touring <laughs> and, uh, and it's the seat. So um, you're on that for like several hours a day. <laughs> I mean, when I was on that trip, like close to 12 hours a day. Um, and so some of the other things I had to work through were like, um, if I did have just discomfort and it wasn't debilitating me, I could still ride with it was it just enduring 12 hours of that? And just, I remember at the end of it, I just like, I'm so ready to just feel comfortable <laughs> during the day. Like it was, it was interesting. Cause then, you know, it's like two and a half months of just feeling uncomfortable almost all the time. Well, what's and the day to day about like, like what are you carrying? Yeah. What are you eating? Where are you yeah. staying? Yeah. Oh, great question. So um, what I ate is pretty much like everything or anything I could find. Um, I was, <laughs> thankfully I was on roads. So I was often having access to gas stations and a um, lot of, lot of junk food um, oh, on the great divide mountain bike ride, route. At some point I had this as bad. Someone had this realization that the only protein I was eating was in peanut butter M&Ms oh <laughs> or no peanut M&Ms, which does less protein. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, this is. I, I like a reality check, you know, and um, 
Not even gas so, station beef jerky? Oh, no. I wasn't in the mood. I was just following my cravings. And, and so, um, but, so, but on the, I don't know, Great Divide route, I had hit a town every three days or so. Cross country, I'd hit one every day at least. And um, sometimes a town just looked like an intersection gas station, but that was enough for the junk sometimes food I was are. carrying. <laughs> uh, um, but I, I carried everything. Yeah, so I carried everything in a little backpack on my back. Um, there were a lot fewer options back then for um, bike touring gear, or and there were fewer companies making custom uh, touring gear. And so I just thought it would be simple if I just put it all on my back. <gasps> oh, sorry, my dogs are... <laughs> joining hi nora you're very enthusiastic she's a cheerleader hi oh, hello nora yeah yeah this is nora bones and she has a sister billy holiday um and then two brothers um but yeah and i just kept things on i would just kept a tarp and i was really like a tarp tent i kept it really minimal on the great divide route i carried more because we're in the rockies so we're going to experience colder temps but um it was so much to carry on my back, especially when you added water. And, and I, I got oh, to the geez. point I was fed up. I was fed up carrying stuff, especially because all that weight then goes onto the seat, which is what no one wants. And um, so, I mean, at, at some point I actually ditched my sleeping pad, my tent, and I picked up a bubble mailer like envelope from the <laughs> post office for free. And that was like supposed to insulate my torso as I slept on like a ground sheet uh, I don't it was bad and of course monsoon season was late that year so I ended up oh, geez. in a pickle but it's fine everything's fine did you like meet <laughs> any interesting people along the way or is it more of a solitary endeavor yeah let's see so the first trip coast to coast um I started out on my own I was um, on my own for two weeks and then my parents got so nervous that my mom flew out with a bike and, oh my God. and yeah and rode with me from memphis no asheville north carolina to memphis and then i had a friend on a bike with me from memphis to colorado and my dad on a bike colorado to the pacific um then the great divide i did with another unicyclist um, oh that's very so, cool yeah yeah um and that you know like when you're both going through a lot of physical challenges um i just had to show the dog <laughs> relaxation occurring right here um you know it is hard it makes the dynamic a little more difficult um i feel like because i was encountering all those mental and physical challenges for the first time on the cross-country trip oh i was probably a horror to be around <laughs> I was just probably miserable, um, but I was able to keep it together a little bit better on the second trip, but then you deal with the dynamic of someone else doing that for the first time, and right, yeah, it's right. just a lot. It's a lot, yeah. So on your resume, like you've done a whole bunch of other like amazing physical feats, but I want to actually ask you, what are your like ambitious, like ambitious goals and plans for the future? Yeah, you know, I feel like the nature of my goals have shifted. I still do a lot of long-distance running. Um, that's just something I really enjoy. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I would do anything to get to space, but I know that's a, just a long shot <laughs> oh, that's the for next anyone. Frontier, right? I know, I know I, that's a long shot for anyone, but in the meantime, I'm, I'm basically just, I've recently accomplished what I had considered to be a lifelong goal, which was to become an engineer. And so I'm working as an engineer now and that it's not as dynamic and it doesn't look flashy on a resume in terms of number of miles ridden or first woman to do whatever but it's actually really it's exactly what I hoped it would be and it feels really good after 30 years of wanting to do this that's to so actually cool. accomplish it so right now I'm just kind of settling into that and enjoying that new chapter amazing honestly do you have any idols or any like people you look up to yeah um I I actually had to answer a question recently at work of if you could go to space with anyone, 
dead or alive, which I wouldn't want to go with the dead alive. person. But I think what they meant by the question is like someone who's already passed. If they could come back to life, you know, <laughs> it's those who would you have lunch with questions, except in a space company, that's how it's asked. So if I could go to space with anyone, it would probably be Anne Bancroft. Uh, she, was, she is uh, the first person to have trekked to the North, um, sorry, first woman to have trekked to the North and South Poles. Wow. Um, yeah, she, and I got to meet her. Actually, that was one of really random kind of breadcrumbs in my trail to Antarctica. I had gone to grad school in Ohio and I got to present at a conference about my unicycle trips. And it was, it was the silliest things that were so coincidental. Like the person presenting right before me in the same room was presenting about her winter in Antarctica. <laughs> the keynote speaker at the conference was Anne Bancroft. I got selected to speak on a panel sitting next to her. It's almost like, straight out of a movie. I know. It was a little ridiculous. I was, but it, it helped give momentum to my dream. So like when those things, it just fed the dream. Right. So then a year after, after I had that encounter, I was like, okay, I got to make this happen. It's not going to happen if I don't apply, if I don't really pursue it. So, um, yeah, yeah, that I, I really admire her and I've really enjoyed reading her book and, um, about some of her adventures. It's amazing. Well, I think that's all the questions I have. Thank you so much for talking to me and giving me a half hour of your time. Oh, Asher, it's great to talk to you too. Um, thanks for considering me for the podcast and putting up with my um, dog cameos. Oh, any anytime. <laughs> Good to meet you, um, Gracie. I'm, you too. <laughs> I'm sure I'll hear about you more in the future. Well, I hope to speak to you again soon. Thanks again. Bye. Bye.